Okay, I'll try that one more time. Hi, everybody. Hola. Sorry, we even have rush hour traffic on Sundays in Atlanta. Oh, man. Who am I? <laughs> question right there. Um, I'm a, a lecturer at the University of Maryland in African American Studies, and I ran on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> No, I am I am humbled and honored to even share space with Jacqueline and she flatters me so much so often. Um, what do I do and who am I? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I also rant on social media, <laughs> but I also host the podcast The Way With a Noah Weekly on Wednesdays at its live stream 9 p.m. It's also podcasts on iTunes and Spreaker and some other stuff, Google Play, I think it is. Um, but I do political and social commentary. And like Jacqueline, I love to call out people on their stuff in a very informative and loving manner. Because um, ultimately, the goal is not just pointing out who does what wrong, but really looking at how can you further dialogue and have meaningful uh, action that's sustainable, right? So... So I feel like people, I feel like people troll, you know, my comments, or maybe we all share a brain. Um, what's really interesting is that we did have this back and forth for like the last several weeks ahead of this article coming out about how the phrase not all black men was like the new not all white people. Now, since the article and the other articles and all the defensiveness, you know, around the article, like I, I get for those who didn't read past the headline or past even the first few lines, why the concept and abstract is problematic, right? Um, and as I've told several folks, you know, publicly and privately, I really don't subscribe to that whole Bash and Brothers thing, right? Like, because I truly believe that if we're really going to have liberation, if we're really going to move the needle for Black people, we have to find a way to work together and do it together. Like, I literally cannot, you know, I'm only one half, you know, of 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 this. Like, I can't do it without my my brothers and my sisters. Like, I can't, right? So I'm not like just into the the, the she man, you know, haters club stuff just just for shits and giggles. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Excuse my language, you guys. It's Sunday. I apologize um, for kicks and giggles. I, I don't I don't do that. But what was really interesting was we were we, there was this conversation happening about you know misogyny, particularly in like our own black progressive space that all of us have been in together. And how there is an issue, even in our own movement spaces, right, between black men and black women and, and talking about, you know, the power dynamics and things of that nature. And like you literally have, you know, some of my dearest who I love so much say, well, not all black men. It's like, can you listen to what the critique is? Because we're not calling out anyone by name in particular. We're talking about situational issues. So we had all these arguments back and forth. about that. I'm like, do you guys not see how not all black men, instead of listening to what the problem is and understanding it and helping us work through how to make this better? Do you not understand how this is literally what white people do to us like all the time when they do the not all white people when we're talking about like issues of race? So like, so I understand. So like with the article and I, not that I agree with everything that Damon has written either, right? There are some things that he's written. I'm like, oh my God, this is like garbage. And he himself has his own, you know, he did, um, he did one of those videos about, you know, stuff bougie black women say, you know, his is one of the funnier ones, but like, so he has had his own issues with misogyny, misogyny and stuff too. Right. So it was a really interesting reflection from a black man. And I really appreciated the attempt. Um, and I think that the sister who wrote the Huffington, I think it was a Huffington post opinion piece. I think she further expounded upon it. Um, but like some of the parallels and the defensive responses I've seen to it, like this is garbage, this makes no sense. I get it, right? Because for black men in America, there it does not, it might not, it's like, this is ludicrous, right? Because, you know, there's the levels of oppression, there's the, you know, different issues that happen. I mean, you could pull out the, 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 the statistics of black men in prison, you pull out so many different statistics and stuff like this is an insane thing to say. But when you're still looking at the power dynamics, and in some conversational spaces, we're still acting as if there is an oppression that is on black men that does not also exist on black women. And then we don't acknowledge that there are, you know, issues, you know, based on gender based on sexual orientation, just other things that further marginalize members of our community as well. So, so it's a very intricate and in in conversation that I would really love for us to have. But these, some of the talking points and some of the real, <laughs> I hate to say, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, meninous, you know, responses to stuff has really shut it down. And some of the responses is like, okay, you prove our point, right? Like you're literally not all white peopling us right now. And, and so it's been, it's been a really interesting like dynamic watching this all unfold. But I think that, you know, we, we, we do have to acknowledge that there are certain actors within our spaces, whether they're academics or so-called, you know, pro-black speakers or whatever they are, that are really problematic and further a dynamic that, you know, Damon and others have been trying to talk to and, and really tease out. Um, and, and if we can really be honest about, you know, what happens in our spaces, because we have some of our brothers who will be the most righteous and stand with us will still, you know, Kate come and Kate for problematic, you know, misogynist. Um, and we have some of those in our space and, and people will like, oh, but they're so bright and da 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 Okay, but you're, you're, you're coddling this type of behavior and not really addressing it. So the article is really interesting. And um, like I said, I can see, and I had a couple of brothers like come to me aside, like, you know, I really respect you. Like one of them actually called me and was like, no, I really respect you. I, and, and, and I had to take a step back and understand some of your posts. But at the same time, I really want you to understand where I'm coming from on this. Sis. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to sit here and give you the respect and listen to you because you came at me with a certain level of respect. So that's, it's only right to give it back and hear you out versus the, this is some garbage, not all black men. Da, 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 da. And so like we can, we can now work and talk together and continue building because we started in this space in our conversational space. So it's, 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 it's an interesting, um, dynamic and conversation, particularly something that's happening so publicly, because usually when we talk about like our community and our issues, it doesn't happen this way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so my, my thoughts actually echo a lot of what Anoa just said. Um, I think first okay. of all, <laughs> I know how, how media works and the title was clickbaity, you know what I mean? Because, you know, when you really, really try to intellectualize the title, it, it just does it. It falls apart. But when you look at the uh, what was trying to, to be said and the issues that needed to be brought up, it was a really important conversation that we need to have and that, you know, black men uh, needed to need to sit back and listen. Um, and I'll admit at first I was like, you know, I had my my analysis and I was ready to do this and that. And then, you know, some sisters that I care about were like, yo, just hold up. Listen to what's being said. And, um, you know, I think uh, the other thing that we have to say is that a lot of this is, is for, for a lot of, you know, brothers who, who think about these issues and think about gender issues. And if you know, you know, anyone who knows me knows, I think about gender and sexuality and all these kinds of things all the time. And I, you know, I'm not perfect. You know, um, I like, like anybody grew up in a patriarchal, homophobic, racist society, and I'm fighting against it. So to say I've won the battle would be ridiculous. Um, but at the same time, you know, I've heard things, you know, recently, like, you know, there's a, there's a thing going around, black men are trash, you know, I've been hearing. And yeah, again, you know. And, and so I think a lot of us are, are starting to put all of this in context with one another when I think they need to be parsed out. I think they... Look, black men have privileges, um, and sometimes they are using these privileges to harm black women and to harm black LGBTQ communities. And that you know, cisgendered heterosexual black men need to have a conversation about how we are going to uh, improve and better our communities and assist our sisters and our children, uh, rather than you know automatically getting defensive when we get called out on it. Um, but I think what's great about what Anoa said also is she was like, you know, it's a, it's a call out, but it's a call out with love. Saying, you know, whereas saying I'm trash is not a call out with love. And I think it goes, you know, for me who studied gender for a long time, it goes against the training of all the great black feminists that, that have trained me and that, you know, all of my mentors were, were either black or Latina, and I think I had one white Jewish woman who, who were who were all my um, my mentors. They were never. I don't think I had a male mentor except for one guy in my entire career. And you know, one of the things that I've learned about womanism is that it is about connecting your you know the pain of women. It wasn't like liberal feminism where it was like, okay, 
we are opposed to men. It was, it was more like we see our struggle in concert with black men, in concert with the people in Puerto Rico, in concert with the people in, in Africa and then all over the world um, because all these oppressions are connected. But black men just need to understand, um, you know, the head slave is still a slave, but he still can, you know, it's possible to be oppressor and oppressed at the same time. And I think there are a lot of brothers that I talk to that don't understand it. They're always like, I'm not in a position to oppress anybody. I'm oppressed. I'm a black man. And it's like, you have class privilege. You have, uh, you know, you have a penis, which makes, which in this society gives you certain privileges, you know, and just because, you know, okay, the police might get at you as if black women aren't the large, the fastest growing prison population in the, in the country. Um, you know, you might have certain things that, that affect you more than others, but at the same time, you are still in a position to oppress and suppress other people. And we have to acknowledge that and have that conversation. Um, I thought the piece, um, when you look at what it was supposed to do, it's not an academic paper, it's a blog post. And I thought as a blog post, you know, to start these kinds of conversations, to have, you know, black men and black women sit there and have a good faith conversation, which we both should come to. It shouldn't be like, you know, I, I read another piece recently where it's like, not only is Damon John right, black, uh, not, I keep calling him Damon John, Damon Young right, black men are terrorists. And it's like, come, come on, man, you know what I mean? That's not a good faith conversation. Let's sit there and be like, look, you, you, that's different than saying you're the white people of black people. It's, you know, I, I think it's what they would, white people or black people is trying to say is you have privileges that you need to acknowledge and that you yeah. sometimes use against other people you know and when you break it down just like that i can't how am i going to deny that i need to come <laughs> come through and be like yo let's okay so how can i be better you know mm -hmm. let's have this conversation about how i can improve absolutely that's a good a good faith conversation i hadn't even heard i haven't even seen that yeah uh, well, you're lucky. <laughs> well, and the thing too for me, just to jump in real quickly, is like, you know, as, you know, partnered to a, you know, big black man who is already painted and called a terrorist by society, right? Mother to a big black man. My son is 13 and about six feet tall and has already been harassed by police in our community. You know what I'm saying? So like, like I take this very, and my brothers, you know, like I said, I take it very seriously because like, these are my people. And if I claim to care about people, about black people, about myself, and I, I appreciate, you know, with, 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 with the brother mentioning, you know, womanism, because I think for so, I think too many of us, as we've moved further, further into the way this society is and trying to get ours and things like that, we lose so much of the teachings that have really grounded and supported our collective struggles. And like, uh, I know I saw an article recently that was saying like one of the things that had actually uh, uh, inspired Kaepernick was Patricia Collins Hill's Black Feminist Thought. That was one of my favorite books in undergrad. And I, I appreciate the conversations and opportunities I had like in the, in the African American Studies classes that I took in undergrad um, that, that, that really did help bring everyone into those conversations, into those dynamics like instead of that this divisiveness that we see in the conversation and rhetoric right now so like here's something like black men are terrorists like i can't imagine trying to raise and groom my son to be all that he can be in an environment that is not only labeling him as terrorists in terms of the white majority society we live in but from black women who are his aunties you know his his caretakers oh his providers like like Preach. especially when we have young but when we have when we look at our schools right most of the teachers, like I've been, I've been praying for Max to have a, a male teacher <laughs> besides a gym teacher. Um, he'll finally get them in high school. But like, you know, women are the main, we, we, we are the caretakers. We are the nurturers. We are the earliest educators that most kids will ever know. And, and to have some folks out there with that mentality towards black boys, black men, it really, you know, creates a further, like a, a, another layer and barrier that further pushes them down a certain, you know, lane. Not that I'm blaming black women for why we have black, black men talking about black women are trash, but we all have to be accountable for ourselves and figure out how do we build and work through this versus furthering, you know, the divisiveness that exists between us. I mean, there are issues on all sides. <laughs> Um, I can tell you right now, and I'm gonna try not to get emotional. So my my mother uh, passed away 
uh, about a year and some change ago. And, you know, even when she was sick and on dialysis, if you would call me trash, she would have gotten up, you know what I mean, out of the dialysis chair and been ready. And the, and the you know, the Brownsville, Brooklyn would have come out of her in a second. Because not only, she, she would tell you, look, she, does, she didn't make no trash. You know what I mean? She made a, a flawed human being who needs to, you know, needs to work and, and improve himself. But one of the things that I'll tell you is, is that my mother would never see herself disconnected from me, you know, and we had a complicated relationship, um, but never saw herself as disconnected from me. So if I was trash, she was trash. So no, I don't, I don't back away from that. Um, I think, you know, one of the things uh, that we have to understand is as black people, I feel like we have to all see ourselves as connected. You know what I mean? Um, and I and I and I appreciate again what what Anoa said is you know is another point that I've made and that is what is it how can we tell have mothers and and aunts and and teachers going out black women calling these young men or boys trash when that's a message they're already getting from a white supremacist society you know what I mean that's a message that they receive implicitly all the time, black men, black boys and black girls. So when you start saying that they're trash, you know, and it's coming from an adult and it's coming from people that they love and admire, you know, how do you expect that kid to really succeed or to, or to you know, reach for better, reach to better himself or even better his community or, and accomplish the goals that, that you want out of it? Um, I think that, Again, I think that that's very different than what Damon Young was was trying to get across. Um, so, you know, I, I had some some issues uh, with the article when I first read it, but then you know I looked at it and I also had some conversations with some women and some brothers, and that's what we're supposed to do. You know, we're supposed to have patience for each other and be like, "Look, let me educate you." I can tell you, you know, when I was eighteen going to college, I'm sure I was, I was a straight up homophobe. I'm sure I was sexist. I just, you know, I was like an 18 year old kid. And it was the mentorship that I got from, from sisters and brothers who were both my age and older that really put me on a, on a better path, you know? Um, and I think if you have knowledge that someone else doesn't have, you shouldn't berate them. You should, you should draw them in closer. At least that's, that's my perspective. Yeah, I'm, uh, well, so one thing that, you know, I used to really go in real hard on, you know, the Umar Johnsons of the world and all the, all the no taps and all of that. One thing that a brother broke down for me was that sometimes those, you know, I used to talk about the books that people bought, uh, you know, when they bought the incense, you know, at the, at the kiosk at the mall and all of that. But then I, I realized that you know sometimes those those books and those arenas can be a gateway to consciousness uh, you know and like we said you know talking about 16 year old jason nichols you know he was studying to be a five percenter you know what i mean he was you know doing a lot of the things that a lot of these young brothers are doing i think it's it's up to us who have who have raised a certain level of consciousness to tell these brothers man like Look, disrespecting black women, you know, is is not cool. You're like that's just that's not, you know, um, you know, uh, raising your level of consciousness. You know, if anything, you know, uh, you're doing our community a disservice. And I think we can we can really reach a lot of these brothers. A lot of them get real tricked and fooled because they hear like. decontextualized facts, you know what I mean? Right. Thing. And, you know, what we really have to do is to pull these brothers in close and be like, look, that's, that's not the way. We got to understand Umar Johnson is a hustler from Philly. Just the way, <laughs> you know, just the way, uh, you know, Terry McMillan was a hustler in the 90s. <laughs> you know what I mean? Terry McMillan was a hustler. He made millions off of complaining and saying, you know, black men were trash, essentially. She's the She's the mother of that movement, I would argue. 
Uh, and, and, you know, she got all of that publicity because, you know, all of a sudden took everything out of context. There was no racism, no sexism, you know, no nothing. It was just some sorry ass black dude, you know, who, who was on drugs or, or was a woman beater or something like that. And it was something that made, you know, the populace think that all black men were either in prison or headed there or dead. Um, and that there were no brothers who were, you know, I, I don't like the good, bad uh, binary, but I would say brothers who are trying to improve themselves. Um, so I think, like, we really need to reach out to these brothers, and, it, and that's the responsibility of black men. So you want to, if people want to go with the metaphor of black men being like white people, just like we tell white people, yo, it's your responsibility to reach out to other white people. Black men, it is our responsibility to reach out to other black men. That's why, you know, even though, you know, at first I had issues with Damon Young's uh, piece, I thought it was a good because it was a brother reaching out to other brothers, you know, or at least I hope it was meant for other brothers, you know what I mean? Um, is So I think it's important for brothers to, to do that. And we can reach those brothers in those spaces. They will actually welcome us, believe it or not. I, I go into those spaces and you would think I would, you know, I would be in alliance then, but a lot of those brothers sit there and we have conversations all the time. Mm. So you will, you will be welcome. <laughs> Us maybe not so much, but but I think <laughs> unless without you paving the way, I think that what you said was spot on about how certain people have been able to leverage platforms and they hustlers, right? Like when I listened to Tariq Nasheed, for example, like I had to block Tariq Nasheed on Twitter, not because, just because I got tired of seeing people retweet him and even like muting him, I still would see, I'm like, once he called, um, what, Simone Biles a Negro bed witch, because she was at, you know, she's a teenager, she was excited to see a Disney star. I mean, like, I can't blame her because Troy Bolton, yeah. you know, what's his name? I forget what his real name is, but his character from, from a, a high school musical, I have teens, so I know this stuff. <laughs> but like, like, you know, he flipped out because she got excited because, you know, I'm um, Zac Efron, right? She, he, he flipped out because she got, I'm like, she's a teenager in, in America and she grew up watching the Disney Channel, like, that type of stuff right there. So, and because there are so many brothers, because like a Umar Johnson, like I remember like the whole recent, you know, dust up over whether or not his PhD was real, blah, blah, blah. There were so many people that I admired who were defending him. And I'm like, whether it's real or not is the point. He's a crook. <laughs> like, what is wrong with you? And we're like, but he spoke such truth. I said, he might have said like three true words out of like a whole 15 minutes. And I think it's right. You know, people do need to go in there, you know, to help educate, to help motivate, to help steer folks in a direction and manner that is actually conducive to us having positive relationships and we do the same on the flip side with, with our sisters but i really do think that the conversation about platform and who gets access and elevated is really crucial we talk about this jackie in terms of like independent media in general but i really think when we're talking about in terms of these spaces um particularly of like black intellectual thought there has been a corner on the market within certain within with certain people you know who have you know, basically built up these huge platforms around us because they have been the ones in the space. Mm -hmm. And I think that we really need to help having more conversations like this and continue to build out, you know, our presence in these spaces to help educate and motivate, you know, and to actualize, you know, better action happening, better thought, better building happening. Because like, I am appalled by some of the conversations happening right now, just even taking it out of the, like, the gender binary, just in terms of things like whether it's a conversation about like immigration right now from certain you know, larger uh, uh, platforms, whether it's talking about this particular article and conversation. I mean, there's a lot that's happening that's very, not just anti-intellectual posing as like the truth, mm -hmm. but, 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 but really like anti-black liberation struggle type conversation, you know, rather capitalist, Republican, like, you know, it, it's masquerading as like black liberation, but it's really something else. And, and, right. it, and it's disconcerting, but since we haven't been as focused, we've been more focused on doing work and raising families, we haven't been focused on building our own like, you know, social media celebrity, right? Right, right. But, but we do actually have to put that focus on building platforms to get the word out, to get the truth to teach. Because this is how, this is another way for us to do the work. So, and, and, and I love, yeah. yeah, and I love that you brought up the, the point about um, the, the kind of conservative capitalist 
um, almost Republican perspective that we're hearing from some in, in the black community that, that's supposed to be like this black liberation kind of talk, but really it's just conservative, feel good, mm -hmm. you know, conservative, do for yourself kind of, because that's what we call it, right? We call it the do for yourself movement, but really all it is is fiscal conservatism, you know, with a black face on it. And, and, and I'm wondering if if some of that conversation is not generational because somebody posted something really interesting today and I wonder the same thing about this conversation that we're having around um, this article mm. the, the, about this issue because it's bigger than the article we know this is bigger uh, than and, the article. And it goes it goes way back and it goes way back it's bigger than the article it goes way back um, um, this this guy who wrote this blog and he's not the first person who's ever had these thoughts you know about about uh, um, uh, the 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 unhealthy um, way that some black men use the power that they have, not realizing that they have power because they they are oppressed and they don't think that they have power to wield. And and for most black men, they don't know this unless it's pointed out to them. Um, but I do wonder though, as I'm seeing the way this conversation is being had again in our communities and I think we need to keep having them almost every generation because you you just have a new group of people coming into the fight who have not had these experiences I do wonder if this issue the way it's being framed now especially with the response from the one young lady who said black men are terrorists I'm wondering if that if that feeling if that attitude comes from like a generational difference in the way we see ourselves in the larger media because like my my husband and I grew up in like what we call the the golden age of hip hop right where people think of hip hop and rap today and they think of something completely different from what we knew when hip hop was hip hop son you know it was my daddy to hip -hop. See, and, and it's freaky when your father is listening to tupac but you're dead, you know but yeah yeah your dad your dad is like all run dmc and 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 you know tribe. yeah tribe and and krs1 and yes yeah, that's tribe. Yeah, so if you ever if if you guys are ever in DC, yeah, that's that's going to be freaky cuz yeah, every Saturday or so. <laughs> but um we were talking earlier mm -hmm. about like when we when when video became a big thing and we were watching uh BET before BET made a deal with the devil. Um, mm -hmm. and we could see KRS-One and Miss Melody and and the X Clan and ISIS and Queen Latifah, you know, or with with U N I T Y saying who you calling a bitch, you know, and and rapping about decking a dude because he put his hands on her, um, and that was our reality, and in our entertainment for a while, and that changed. And we, and we all know what it changed to, and that's a whole nother discussion about whose fault that is, you know, who's, who, who bears the responsibility for that change, because I think there's enough responsibility to go around. Um, but I don't have the experience of, like, street harassment. I've, I, I've lived in D.C. for most of my life. I grew up also in a small town in, in Virginia, small rural town in Virginia. I've been in New York City, um, drunk as a skunk on many occasions. I'm no, not trying to disparage skunks, you know. But <laughs> I've been just, you know, out of my mind um, on something, wandering around New York City, um, and Philadelphia a couple of times, and I don't have the experience of, I know Anoa is smirking because she's like, when was Jackie ever that drunk? You know what I That's okay. I know because I, I tell that to some people and that's the look they give me. They're like, Please, you taught Bible study. <laughs> like, I didn't. I didn't come out of the womb teaching Bible study. <laughs> Not addressed and are further even more exacerbated now 
now. Like, like there's a lesser sense of the community, I think, as a whole, here in the 21st century. And in many ways, maybe we had, you know, when we were growing up in the 80s, you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, I, I just, I just, whether it's conversations we've seen people have around R. Kelly and, and, you know, sex trafficking and things like that, I think there is a feeling that black women are victimized and brutalized at a rate and nobody cares. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I don't while I don't agree with calling black women terrorists at the same time we really actually do have this issue. Um yeah. and then there are those who are in their way, despite how brilliant they are, to just try and use statistics and stuff to prove that black women really aren't that brutalized as they realize black women, blah blah blah. All types of nonsense, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Well, that was annoying as all get out. We apologize. There was some issue with the camera. And uh, let me see. There we go. We're back. Yeah, my camera's back. But I... <laughs> uh, okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, and I, I am going to... Uh, I'm just going to cancel that. I'm going to cancel that because that's just, anyway, um, <laughs> I, I, I think that was a, an issue with the service. I, we apologize, you guys. That was, we're going to obviously have to have that, the rest of that discussion again um, <laughs> at another time. Um, but it's good that the conversation wasn't lost on people who were willing to look past the headline and read the article and maybe even reread the article mm -hmm. um, so that they could come to uh, an understanding of what was being said rather than to feel um, to feel aggrieved and just you know walk away and 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 walk away with with that feeling of of frustration and anger, which happens so frequently when we talk about white supremacy. But um, and we get frustrated when white people do that to us. You know, when we when we when you know we see an article when they see an article where the title is has white privilege in it, and they don't want to read it because they're sick of hearing about white privilege, and they don't get into the article to understand the the topic, the point. Um, it is. It, it's re it was really great to hear, hun, that your perspective changed on some things, and you realized it wasn't just a hit piece on black men right. the way it was made to you know sound. Um, and and this, you know same thing with Dr. Nichols. And you know we're hoping that that is true of many more uh, uh, brothers who who we need to sit down and have this conversation. But with. see, that's the thing. We 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 we. We throw these terms around, brothers and sisters, and I, and I you know, I'm really, I, I guess in my, I'm, I know things happen, technical things happen. I would love to have um, continue this conversation uh, with our guests, um, but you know, one of the things that I think that bothers me is, is the use of language and the way that we use these terms, uh, brothers and sisters. I mean, I'm not your brother if I'm a terrorist. You know, I'm not your brother if I'm trash. You know, you're not my sister if you're a bitch. You know, how can I consider you my sister if you're a hoe? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and all of these other things. And and, and, I, and a lot of it is, I think, is misdirected anger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, that we throw at each other. I, I knew that that's what I, that was the vibe I was getting uh, when I was a, a much younger man. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I used to see this stuff being played out on the media. And I said, wow, you know, just so much venom, man. It was like so much anger and hostility that was being thrown around, you know. And um, and it just showed me that, you know, we weren't listening to each other. Right, right. We just what you know, we just weren't listening to each other. Um, everybody was going back into their particular camps. And, and, and you know, and um, when you had the, the, the white press come in to exploit that, Cause that's what I thought it was. It was all exploitation, mm -hmm. and um, so they get involved in it. And I don't care if Oprah was holding the mic at the time; she was part of the white media too. And um, so when that stuff started, you know, it, it really didn't allow uh, uh, for any real conversation to go on. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the way I took out of it. I remember um, leaving that discussion angry, 
Uh, I remember, um, uh, you know, leaving those programs and I'm angry and mm -hmm. and not understanding, like, what the hell did I do to them? Right. You know what right. I mean? You know, and, uh, you know, but but then again, you know, like Dr. Nichols said, you know, you grow, you mature, mm -hmm. and you start, you know, your perspectives change. Now, I don't think the same way I did when I was 18. And um, your, your perspectives change. And then, like you said, once again, here we have another generation, and we're having this conversation all over again. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, uh, do we get are they back? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we I can are. stop running my mouth. No, you can't stop running your mouth yet. Keep on <laughs> running your mouth till we get Dr. <laughs> Nipples on. Oh no. No, but um but what I'm saying is, is that I'm all I'm suspicious of having these conversations um because we got real enemies out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm and, and I'm really and, and I'm really um uh protective of, of uh, not only our space um, to have these kind of conversations and dialogues, mm -hmm. but I'm really, really suspicious of, of hidden agendas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially when it comes to the, you know, um, to white society and and uh, white feminism and, and all of those things. And because I think that that these discussions um, are, are are needed, mm -hmm. you know, but we have to be on guard too about. Um, and, and I hate, and maybe this might be the wrong analogy to use. But you know, this this whole thing in the media about Russia and how the Russians, uh, um, you know, um, are you you know how they tried to sow discord in this country um, by exploiting racial tensions and you know it's, it's an old tactic, it's an old right. ploy. Mm -hmm. But um, but we've had that done with us, you know, and, and especially in in areas where uh, such as this, when we when we're trying to um, heal uh, as black men and black women. And we're trying to, to talk to each other. And then again, you know, you have people with their hidden agendas. And, um, and we talk about this all the time. I, I, you know, I, I think that one of, the, one of the weaknesses that we have, and I hope you get them quick because I don't want to keep talking. <laughs> uh, but, I, but one of the um, issues that I think that we have is that we don't, or I, I won't say we don't, but um, we don't respect the struggle before. Right. And what I'm saying, right. and we don't respect the references from before. We don't, we don't, we don't respect those people who, who, who understood, like my mother and my grandmother, who were well aware of white feminism mm -hmm. and, 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 and the tactics they used to destroy the black family. Right, right. You so, know, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, like through the welfare and exactly. I mean, movies like Claudine was made about that. And, right. And, and, and there's this whole um, lexicon of, of struggle that um, a lot of uh, today's uh, young activists don't know about, not because the information is not out there, because it is out there. Um, and <laughs> we're using a medium now where people can find all of that information, mm -hmm. but because uh, a lot of the times they just don't do uh, a lot of the work. So that's why we have to have these intergenerational conversations uh, about these things in our experiences and how they're not always they're not always the same, but they're not always different. Mm -hmm. um, like you know, like this conversation that I'm so glad we're able to continue at least partially. Yes. Um, and again, we apologize, you guys, uh, for the um, for the interruption. Look, this you you know this is what happens when when you're trying to do something like this on working people's budgets. We don't have yeah. CNN money. And, and, we don't have yeah. TYT money. And you're, from um, a and you're from a generation still trying to navigate this dad one technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're just all, look, if you, it, one day we're going to, we're going to see if we can like set up a camera so you can see, so you can see how we set the, we've got like three laptops of uh, a mobile phone, some lamps on the dining room table. Duct tape. Duct tape. So, you know, the dog is over there on the couch. And he got, he got, tin, he got tin foil on him. Yeah, just, you know, so the reception is really good. He's got, some, he's got a little tin foil on his tail. Yep. Did, you know, make him wag it just to get... But, but, but let, me, let me say this real quick. Um, and and I, I like to get a, a no in on this too. Mm -hmm. Is um, because now I'm, I want to go into an area while we still got a little time left. Um... Now, we what responsibility? Now we now you know we, we started this dialogue, and what is the responsibility I think on black women because that that's 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 been a major complaint 
is the fact that now we have this. Now we went to the to the to, to the march yesterday, Black Women Matter. I was so uh -huh. glad to be a part of that. Uh -huh. the, yeah, the March for Racial Justice right. and the March for Black right. Women, which well, converge. Right now, what I wanted to say is, and not that this is conditioned. And I, oh God, I hope I'm not being a white person right now. <laughs> But but I, I, I just want to put this out there uh -huh. is that you know where's the responsibility on black women now mm -hmm. um, to um, where this conversation is going? What I'm saying is, and let me just be a little bit, let me just be more specific. There's a lot of stuff going on about um, they say, well, okay, black women um, they they want black men to to hear um, their concerns and their issues and and, and what's going on. But then when you're in the street, right? Now we know that more black women are becoming educated than black men, more black women on ca college campuses and, um, and all these other things. And on the street, you hear black men complain all the time that, okay, um, you know, this is what is expected of us. But when black women choose mates, they normally don't choose the mates that they, you know, and, and, and I think it was Jason Black who said one time that like 3% of black males father like most of the black kids and most of them are um <laughs> and you know and, and these would not be the type of males mm -hmm. that right that you would figure um that that you know women of education mm -hmm. or women of certain you know certain standards would, would go for but you can walk out our door and see women going to work for corporate america and messing with a dude that's all tatted up and he's in the house playing video games all day and this that and the other but then the guy who is you know, striving and he's doing this and he's doing, and you and I talk about this all the time. All the yeah, time. Yeah, they don't want him. So what I'm saying is, is that in this conversation, can there be a, a, a part where black women may sabotage sometimes? And I, like I said, I hope I'm not sounding like a white person, but they sabotage sometimes the same thing that they really want. And that, that's, that's my question. Um, I think that with people in general, right, people um, can sometimes, in terms of the visceral responses that they have to what they perceive as, you know, a problem or injustice or whatever, can definitely react in a way that is ultimately sabotaging, you know, the greater good. Um, and I, I think that when we look at so many of us have, we bring our own baggage to these conversations, we bring our own you know, stressors and, and experiences and all types of stuff these conversations that that can negatively impact the way in the which it is received. I mean, I have participated in, unfortunately, I mean, I take responsibility for my own stuff, <laughs> but I've also witnessed, you know, very uh, tragic exchanges between people who would otherwise, you know, in another situation be natural allies or, 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 or comrades, so to speak, right? Like, like, I do think that there, there is a, a time and a place for having certain sessions or tell-offs or however we, we phrase it. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's challenging, right? Because on the one hand, people should be allowed to express themselves, you know, in the moment and in the venue where, you know, and, and, and perceived injustice or egregious, you know, action is happening. On the flip side, we have to find a way to talk about things that's actually productive, right? Because I think so much of what we witness sometimes in terms of meltdowns and people having these shouting matches, it's really counterproductive to the goals that we're all saying overall, you know, are, are, are what we're, we're about. Um, as for what, what these countries is happening as publicly as they do, I think it's a reflection of this microcosm of society, right? Because we have so many really important conversations happening very publicly in a very um, quick, fast-paced session that is not very nuanced at all, mm -hmm. that lacks a lot of context or, or, or true analysis and is just very emotional and not really grounded in anything. And, and you know, I have been quoted numerous times saying my anger is righteous, but at the same time, it has a place. Mm -hmm. um, and not every conversation requires that, but I do think part of the tension for some of us, um, speaking as, you know, I'm not going to say I'm speaking for all Black women, for some of us, um, there does seem to be this notion that we have to bite our tongues or somehow talk really nicely uh, or else people won't listen. And that gets back to the earlier part of our conversation about, you know, people being really white people because it comes to the similar like, if we talk really nicely to white people about race or uh, like the email that I shared with Jacqueline the other day. Um, <laughs> oh my God. I need to be more of a mild mannered mammy type and, and motivate people in the movement. Whatever. <laughs> but... 
but it's a challenge. And so I do think that for those of us who can step outside of those moments and help facilitate these interactions, we should mm -hmm. where possible. But I don't think that means that we have to solely bear the emotional burden of these interactions as well. Like, I think for those of us who are able to, like, even if we're not all necessarily in agreement, like to be able to find some way to help strategically facilitate the space for these dialogues to happen right. in a way that allows people to express themselves, but also is productive and conducive to something, you know, substantive coming out of it. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, what, what you were saying about, you know, the responsibility that, you know, specifically um, black women bear in some of these messed up um, interactions that, that we have, you know, I go back to those talk shows in like the late 80s and the 90s. I mean, that stuff was damaging to me. I mean, because I was like, what? at what point is somebody going to stand up and say to some of the women who are on who were on those stages, yo, y'all are out of line with this. You, This is not, you know what to, and at the time, we didn't know what was happening in our communities. We didn't know what it was called, right? But we knew that something coordinated, orchestrated, and, and planned was happening to our communities. And instead of, and so there was no context provided for anything that was talked about in relation to the dysfunctionality of the black, you know, of the black family. There was no context when it came from um, Moynihan and how the Moynihan report was taken out of context and, and bits and pieces of that was, were used to pathologize black mm -hmm. people and black families in general. And then when we were faced with the crises that we were faced with in the, in the late eighties and the nineties in response to black women kind of having to, um, carry the load right, right. because our men were being, like literally plucked off the street just about and and thrown into jail we didn't provide enough of us did i shouldn't say we that's not that's not correct in the venues that these conversations were had there were not enough women who were allowed in those venues to provide that context mm -hmm. and i and i remember one show i can't remember who the host was but Somebody in the audience did get up and it was it was a black man. He got up and he said, now, wait a minute now, you know, you know that we, we don't have jobs because we can't find jobs. <laughs> you know, we, we you know, we, we are we're up against it now. And man, he was shouted down by every woman in, in, in that audience just about. And it was like it's that kind of stuff where I look at um, I look at women and I think. We, we can't, we can't subscribe. We have to be real careful not to subscribe to other people's um, characterizations of our people. We have to be really careful not to internalize the, the, the outward, the, the outward effects of, of what is happening to all of us and then turn it on each other. Black men have to be careful not to do that with the, you know, black women ain't shit narrative. You know, well, they, the, don't support their they don't support their men. You know, Puerto Rican women are better. We just watched a video the other day. I can't believe people still say that kind of. I, I really can't kind of can't believe that people still say things like, you know, white women are better than than black women because white women or Puerto Rican women or Asian women or whatever women will cook for you and and clean your clothes and and do this that and the third. And I and, and at the same time, I still don't believe. I can't believe sometimes that. Black women, that some black women will say things like black men are terrorists. And I'm just like, this is, none of this, none of this is, is helping any of us individually heal, which I know that's a tall order, right? We've got enough on our shoulders as people, just as people dealing with white supremacy and everything that comes with that. But then we got to be careful to look out for the mental health of ourselves and our people. And we see how broken and damaged we are mm -hmm. by the way we we have a hard time dealing with each other sometimes, right? I mean, we were listening to a speech by uh, Dr. John Henry, Henry Clark. And, it, and it, I think one of the one of the great tragedies 
is that people like Dr. John Henry Clark and, and Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, Welsing and Kwame Ture um, have left this life before social media became a thing. I understand that you know we, we get the benefit of their words now still, but man, I would love to be able to tell Dr. Francis Quest Welsing, you were right about that. Because remember when she said, look, white people's problem, the problem with white supremacy is that they're afraid of their gene pool dying off. So that's why they do what they do. That's basically what she said. And everybody said that that woman was insane when she said that. Right? Everybody says she was nuts, even black people. And I think she said that maybe 20, 30 years ago, yeah. maybe even longer ago. And people were like, I mean, well, yeah, people were like, well, that's just ridiculous. Well, guess what? She was right. No, she's absolutely she right. She was right. She I mean, so so it's like I, I it, it, we've got so much on us already having to deal with the, you know, the wolf at the gate, <laughs> the yeah. wolf that's always been at the gate always for 400 years that wolf has been at the damn gate but at the same time we've got to deal with the 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 fallout from the terror and the terrorism from the wolf at the gate that's now infected everybody inside the gates and we were listening to dr john henry clark the other day and he he made a point that every time i repeat it blows my mind all over again our families are only about 150 years old in this in this country in this country, our concept of families, a family only about 150 years old, because before that, it was illegal for us to have families. So we had. I, I would disagree with that, but you know. I mean, we we had we our yeah. our families were at, our families were at the mercy of the people who owned us. So if. Right. So if we wanted, so if the people who owned us were, were cool with us keeping our families together, then they let us keep our families together. But if they decided they wanted to sell off our family members, then that's what they did. Um, and, and then we have to think of the fact that what we learned about family um, was very much a white supremacist construct. So these ideas of gender and how men and women relate um, and, and, and are in relationship with each other, they're, I mean, they're all kind of infected by those, those messed up things. So we're still kind of learning how to be in relationship with each other um, in this country. Um, our, our cousins on the continent, that, that's a completely, it's the same kind of issue, but it's, but it's a little bit different. But they're right. relearning too from right. the way our families were in in Africa from uh, from what we know of history. So it's like when you when when you factor all that in, at least when I factor all that in, sometimes I kind of come up with, well, dang, how are we supposed to have gotten this right yet? <laughs> right. Who's saying hi? <laughs> right. That's my that's well, my future right there, Mr. Maximus. When it comes to hi, oh hi. But um, uh, Doctor Nichols said that he agreed with that, and I, uh, disagreed with that. And yeah, I, and, and I want to know. I want to know. I, yeah. So why do you disagree uh, with that a little? So the only reason I, I disagree with that was because there's a misunderstanding. I think a lot of times about slave families, um, and slave relationships. You know, there's you know Herbert Gutman said a long time ago. Um, most slave relationships were lifelong and sanctified by ritual. There's this mm -hmm. idea that people were just, you know, going around like they didn't come, have a concept of family. And I think that's also misunderstanding or, or at least downplaying the, the strength of, of black people's spirit and the fact that we were going to form our own families regardless. So even if you were master's child, I was going to take you in as my own. You know, sure. and, and even if, you know, if, if your husband got sold away, I was going to look out for you. You know what I mean? Like, so I really think uh, we've always had family. And the first thing that black people did after emancipation is look for their families. Is look, well, that's true. That, that's the yeah. first thing they did. So you, I, I think the idea that they didn't have families before then 
Um, I think is 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 a danger. I understand what John Henry Clark was trying to say, but I think it's a dangerous statement to make. We had this. I don't know if you read that blog that this woman wrote about getting her white professor fired because uh, the professor actually quoted. She assaulted or, her. Is that the woman about the woman that got assaulted recently by the white professor that they got fired? No. They had a debate over the. Because it's about- a similar story. That they had a debate, an argument over black families in the class, and the professor had never been corrected before. Really? I think that might be it. She well, just recently there's an article now. That woman has now been charged with assault because she she assaulted that girl in the supermarket. It, wow. The professor? Just, yes, the professor assaulted the girl in the supermarket. If it's the same student. Wow. Um, hey, but go ahead. Was- I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry, because my, my girlfriend just sent it to me like two days ago. Yeah. And there was an incident before, like during the spring semester or something, like a while back. The professor has since been, the professor har- harassed her on social media or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So the, the professor was she, dead wrong. She's, she's, about- now getting, she's now being charged with assault because she put her hands on that girl in the supermarket. Well, so, so- but her, the, thing, the thing that's bad about it all is the professor didn't just trust herself and say, no, my answer is right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And her answer is right. Her answer that black families were not destroyed by family by slavery is absolutely true. You know, her mm-hmm. government, I've never, I've listened to all kinds of scholars. I have yet to hear a scholar say Gutman was wrong about that. Um, and this same girl, this same young woman, I should say, was the was the same person who said that uh E. Franklin Frazier was a white man. E. Franklin Frazier was a professor at Howard University and the first black head of the American Sociological <laughs> Society. So, like, you know, I think there's that the professor was, you know, a little too, I don't know what her issue was, but the way she handled that was all wrong. She deserved to get fired. And the fact she put her hands on it, she's really tripping. So maybe she's got a mental issue. Right, but right. I think my point is that I think we need to understand about the strength of, of our spirit and our ancestors and how they held our families together. Okay, um, that's that's a, okay. That's that's a point that you know, I yeah I, I I agree with that. I, I agree uh-huh. with that. That's a better. I think that's a. I think it's true. I think I can say that it is true that um, that the idea of of well how how do I say it that that we weren't allowed to have to have families that were unmolested. Absolutely. By uh, by you know, by the terrorism and the tyranny of of white supremacy and sl- and, and racism I, and slavery. I think that's the best I can come up with for right now. <laughs> no, I, I would agree, and I would add to that. One of the things, like we were talking before we got cut off, we were talking about the dudes who who follow people like Tariq Nasheed, mm-hmm. and, and you know Tariq Nasheed, who is an actual pimp. Uh, you know, <laughs> which is kind of scary to me. I, I always am like, I can't believe this, but. At the same time, you know, we have to understand, I I try to, and and one of my boys said it really well, is that they don't understand about the the venom that these guys spread when they say, you know, for example, that white supremacy or colonialism brought homosexuality. And I'm like, no, white supremacy and colonialism brought homophobia. That's what you don't realize. Mm. You know what I mean? It's it's white supremacy that created these isms to divide us, including homophobia. They're not saying there was no patriarchy in Africa prior pre-colonialism. We know that. Um, But it certainly manifested itself differently. And, you know, I would hope that were, you know, were the world if things world history had worked out differently that we would at least be having a different conversation between african men and african women were we not as you said molested by colonialism and and slavery so what what did you have no i'm I, you know i'm what i want to know is now that we got this conversation started where do we go from here mm-hmm. where do we go from here and and how should how should the language if the like if, if I mean if there's such thing as that, how should the language be framed? Because I think a lot of the hurt and pain comes from the language that we use to address each other. 
Yeah, um, you know, I think it's really, it's really dangerous. I don't know if you've ever seen this blog. Like me and me and a friend of mine always talk about this blog. Have you heard of it? It's called For Harriet. Yes. Yeah. You know, a, a, a female friend of mine uh, wrote a poem and put it up, published it on For Harriet, and it was about wanting a black family and wanting, you know, to find a partner. And it was a little bit about her loneliness. And she just got bombarded with negativity. People telling her to kill herself, just ridiculousness. Wow. Wow. And it's like, yo, why don't we treat our own people? And that's why I'm like, all of this, as, as I think Anoa pointed out, a lot of this is neoliberal capitalist, you know, hustle by a few folks that really don't care about our people. Mm -hmm. They don't care about mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and so I think we need to really call out the callers out in some cases. You know, um, they're the people a lot of times who are really just acting, doing white supremacy's work of dividing us rather than just having honest conversations and saying, look, how are we going to fix this? And how are we going to train our children to not have these same biases? And so we're not having this same discussion 20 years from now. Right. You know, um, I think that's that's the big thing we we really need to focus on is how how what are the steps to to better ourselves and I think that's possible if you think about the fact that forty years later or fifty I guess fifty five years later uh, people are still having Kwanzaa celebrations because you know my man came up with uh, this idea in his head mm -hmm. if we can do that and come up with principles that people are still citing to this day. We can start today and come up with principles against patriarchy, against homophobia, mm -hmm. and restructuring our families to be positive. So I think I think this is all very possible. We just have to get past the you know the negative, uh, the negativity instead of you know just embracing one another and saying, "Look, you got to fix yourself." Mm -hmm. So Noah. And I think that it's okay to understand that we can't, we're not going to be able to save everyone, right? Like we're not going to be able to bring everyone along with us. Unfortunately, that's just, that's just human nature. I mean, I know Harriet Tubman would have loved to save, you know, so many more people, but like folks got to want to go, you know what I'm saying? Folks got to want to be, want to change for that to happen. Um, but I, but I definitely agree about, you know, having the conversation and dialogue, but I think it also goes back to what we've talked about previously, Jackie, and um, I know you all have been building this already, but Luke Foundation is, 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 you know, having those platforms, those spaces for these dialogues to not only, you know, happen, but also to share and lift the work so mm -hmm. that we have people who can talk about these issues and and we're also trying to protect people who come into the space and share right because right. like a lot of these sites it really is you never read the comments either, right like like for these sites they will let so much happen like they don't care they don't moderate their sites and stuff like that they put you out there like yeah you get to put your piece but like you're not necessarily protected as yeah. someone who's out there sharing stuff so like I really think that, that that we have to find a way also to build in that support for people because it does take a lot to be among the first to be out there to put yourself out there. Yeah, yeah. And and I mean for, for those of you who stuck in with us in Luke My Nation, thank you so much for sticking in with us through the technical issues. And thank you, Anoa and uh Dr. and uh, Jason Nichols for um coming back on with us. Uh yeah. <laughs> Just, such is life but uh but see that's that that's like uh uh that's just one of those uh, 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 a small example of of i think like um the larger truth about us about black people we're freaking resilient man we've been through some shit i cuss on sundays i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> And I said I wasn't going to because I put this link on. Okay. So anyway, yeah, our pastor knows how I am. So, all right. <laughs> but we, we've we been through some stuff and, and we have been manipulated and our experiences have been used against us. Our history has been first hidden from us and then it's been twisted and, and revised to say something that it doesn't really say. And we have never been taught it. And it, we and somehow we're still here. 
We've been in the crosshairs of the criminal justice system. We've been cannon fodder for the military. We, we've been enslaved for two and a half centuries and um, emancipated with nothing but you know the, the clothes on our backs and we're still here. So I don't expect whatever this is to, to do anything to us that all of that and a bunch of other stuff that I couldn't even mention because we don't just have time hasn't been able to do. Having said that, it's also like any, any like small infection, you know, an, an infection from a small cut. If you, if you ignore it, it can turn into something very serious and gangrenous and it can cost you a limb. The reason we do these kinds of things in, in Lupmon Nation and we make people privy to these conversations, part of my reasoning for doing it is I need for our, I absolutely need for our, our black brothers and sisters to, to stop some of this foolishness. Stop calling each other names and, and you know, if you want to have a dialogue, have a dialogue and have it like, like we've said, in good faith. You know, don't don't come at people swinging just because you don't like what they've done, um, because some people will duck, run and never come back. But some people will swing back and right. and neither one of those outcomes are going to get us anywhere. But I also need our white brothers and sisters to understand that we don't have time for your stuff. We don't have time to carry your water. We don't have time to make you feel good. We don't have time to make you comfortable. In, in these these conversations that we're having about white supremacy, the wolf at the door, because we're dealing with this other stuff too. Yeah, that's not to say that you're not dealing with stuff, but we don't have time to deal with your stuff, that stuff, and this stuff. We don't. So, thank y'all so very much for joining us tonight on Lupmon Nation. And we hope you'll come back again, and and then that that time we'll we'll have uh, we won't have any interruptions. Um, and it would be great if you guys could come to D.C. and come to our Alice House and have dinner, and then we could broadcast that, and that would be so much fun. <laughs> well, Doc Nichols, he's close by. That's right. That's right. He's right around the corner. Yeah. There's no excuse for him not to visit. Absolutely. <laughs> But thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Subscribe to us here on YouTube. Subscribe to Brick by Brick on YouTube. Like us on Facebook. Uh, Coffee, Current Events, and Politics and Luke Mon Nation on Facebook and Brick by Brick. We are, <laughs> I have to, you know I always have to remember, um, contribute to our Patreon. Uh, consider becoming a patron or our GoFundMe account. We are in the pre-production phases of our documentary. Baltimore after the fire. I'm so excited that in the next month or two, we're going to be going to Baltimore. Go, we're going to be taking stills. We are setting up meetings with people to do interviews. And we've so, got two of them right now. We have two. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I, I love to talk about Baltimore. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, y'all are going to have to come by my house because I live on the way. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's, that's perfect. We'll come pick you up. <laughs> and then we'll make a de detour down through Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> So look, I, good night, y'all. Right, Peace, good night. be good, be good to each other.